off the ground. So um, first of all, we probably have a relatively small group here tonight. Um, we had an issue with Zoom um, not sending out the reminder uh, that it usually sends out to everyone with the registration link. So if you're here, um, you have learned uh, that the old link works as well. Um, it's the same registration link. It's the same link for every webinar, but a um, couple hundred folks, I think, are uh, a little bit lost right now. So <laughs> we'll send a whole everyone who didn't make it their recording. Um, but a couple quick things I want to uh, remind you guys of as we get started. And one is if you have any questions, then go ahead and put those in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. And you can get those questions answered. And we also have a treat for you guys tonight because we have uh, multiple speakers. So I'm going to take the first 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to be hearing from uh, James and Sherry on drone layers. Uh, Dodie Stillman is going to talk about solar wax melters. And then I'm going to chime in at the end on requeening. So we've got a full night. So we're going to go ahead and start diving right in. So a couple, couple, couple quick updates. You probably saw this in the pre-Zoom call ad, but um, we have we still have bees left. So we've still got um, some complete summer hives if you're still looking for bees. Uh, we continued our webinar sale. So if you for the next seven days, um, you can get 20% off of uh, syrup, pollen patties, sticky boards, bro easy check tests. Uh, using the coupon code on our website, August webinar. So get some, uh, now we're going to talk a lot about syrup and pollen. So this is a great time to take advantage of that sale. One thing new we're also doing is if you go to our website and check out our class section, you can see um, on-demand classes that you can stream. Uh, you know, most of our classes we do live, but now we're, uh, we have a lot of those recordings uh, that you can purchase as well. And so you've got summer splits, summer hive care and parole management are all classes that you can stream on demand. With that, um, let's jump out into the bee yard and let's see what on earth the bees have been doing um, now that uh, summer is here in full force. So let's jump to the bee yard and take a look at what's going on. Hey, happy Thursday, everybody. So welcome to the bee yard. It's about 94 or five degrees today. So a pretty toasty day. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon. So pretty warm to be inspecting bees. So we're not going to spend a lot of time digging into the hives because we don't want them open more than five to 10 minutes per hive when it's really hot and sunny. Uh, but our main focus today is we split a lot of the hives in this yard. Um, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we made some summer splits and so we're going to be checking back on those. And then we're really going to be inspecting for food stores, pollen stores, uh, brood patterns, and just kind of do a, a standard summer inspection to analyze now that the honey's all been pulled, some have been split, some weren't strong enough to split. We're just going to check each colony, kind of like I said, your standard summer inspection to see if they need anything uh, in the next month or so. So let's jump right in. So this was actually a hive that did not get split. So it was uh, one deep and one medium. We pulled about 20 pounds of honey off of it. And we gave this hive a uh, mite treatment, um, a pollen patty, uh, and some food about, a, about a three weeks ago, at, right after we pulled the honey. And you can see, even though this isn't a terribly strong hive, they've eaten, this was a one pound pollen patty, and they've essentially eaten all of it, except for, you know, maybe a, a tenth of it is left over here. We've got our Apivar strips um, in this hive as well, um, two strips per box. And I'm just gonna do a real quick check and see, you know, what kind of food stores they've got. So this was their second brood box. Uh, we've got a medium on this one for a second brood box. And this is actually, it's looking really good. Um, so you can see, you can see we've got uh, cleared out space here in the middle. All this middle area is cleared out and there's actually eggs and larva in there. 
And on the edges here, we've got uh, capped and uncapped honey. You can see some more capped honey up here. This is what I love to see this time of year. Um, you know, these frames that have a good thick band of honey or syrup around the edges, and then the middle is left open for a brood. And that's, you know, a great way to reassure yourself you're not overfeeding, you know, when you've got several frames that all have, you know, that open space in the middle for brood, and then around the edges you've got you've got your honey. We've got our uh, beetle trap. We've got several little beetles caught in there, and then these outside frames in this second super are just honey. So these are just frames of honey, which is about right. So I like to lift up on this second brood box to get a feel for how much stores it has in it, and lifting up. I'd say this has about 25 to 30 pounds stored in the second box. And that's just about right. I mean, that's really what I'm going for. So I may give this hive, you know, a gallon of syrup and then uh, three weeks later, I may give it another one, but it's got about 25 pounds stored up in that second box. So they're about where I want them. My, my goal is always over the summer to try to maintain um, about 30 pounds in the second box. That's kind of what I'm going for quantity-wise in that second box. Now our bottom brood box here, is pretty much more of the same. So again, we've got the middle frames, I've got open, cleared open space for brood in the middle of the frames. And then the outside frames are honey, which is just exactly what I'm wanting to see. Um, here's our queen. Just, it's, always, it's always fun to see queens. Um, so here's our queen bee right here. She's healthy and happy. She's got a little mark on her back, as you can see. And she's laying really well. I mean, this hive doesn't have a ton of brood, but they've got, I'm gonna say about four frames of brood in the bottom box. And they've got about two combined frames of brood in the, uh, in the top box. So one thing I'm not seeing in this hive that is not that uncommon. I'm not really seeing hardly any pollen stores. And so if I can go through these frames and I'm not seeing, you know, a combined total of a half a frame of pollen, then I'm gonna feed them a pollen patty, which is what you already saw. And it's a good thing, because yeah, this hive has almost no pollen stored in the hive. And so that pollen patty will really help them continue rearing brood, even though there's very little natural pollen coming in because, hey, it's August in Texas. Okay, so this hive was split. We've got two deep brood boxes. Uh, we made the split about three weeks ago. And because it's summer, I don't ever like to have just a single brood box in the summertime or just one box on any hive because they get too hot. I like to make sure every hive, even right after a split, has at least uh, is comprised of at least two boxes and that just keeps them a lot cooler. So this hive was split about three weeks ago and we immediately put a second box. We were fortunate enough to have a second box that already had a little bit of drawn out honeycomb in it. Um, we gave this one a patty as well. As you can see, they've eaten the majority of this patty. Um, you can see there's actually a little small hive beetle uh, right here running around on this patty. But, the bees are eating it faster than that small high beetle can lay eggs. So it's not too much of a concern. We also treated this hive with uh, Apigard uh, rather than Apa bar strips, which works quite well. And it looks like, so in our second brood box, they've started drawing out uh, honeycomb and they've got some honey some good honey stored up in this second box. I'm feeding these splits pretty heavily um, because they've got a lot of work to do and they're storing it. I mean, you can see they've got a beautiful frame of honey here and they're drawing out 
that's what was not already drawn out in this box. So this box is about, about halfway drawn out. About half the frames are still foundation. And the other half was already drawn out and the bees are filling that with honey. And they're just now starting to uh, draw out additional comb. This is a terrible time of day to inspect the population of the hive. You know, oftentimes right when I pull the lid off of a hive, I look down into that top box and assess, you know, okay, how many frames of bees am I seeing? If I'm looking down between these frames, how many of those frames look like they're covered with bees? It's so hot this time of day, it's just hard to do that. A lot of times the bees are down in the bottom of the box. Sometimes they're outside of the hive. Sometimes they're hanging out underneath the hive. It's just a bad time of day. If I really want to get a good feel for my uh, bee population, I try to look early in the morning, uh, ideally, because that's the best time when you're really going to see, uh, you know, the true hive population. So let's just look real quick in the bottom box and see how they are looking. Sorry, guys. A little camera malfunction there. Uh, my uh, assistant, who is a uh, tripod, um, decided to, to break there for a second. So, sorry about that. So, this hive, let's see what we got going on. So, this is the one that was split. So, we took a split um, off of this hive. And the biggest thing I'm always looking for after a split is was the new queen accepted or not? This one actually looks like it's queenless. Now, a couple quick things I wanna show you guys. One of the signs I always look for when I'm trying to decide if a hive is queenless or not, you see these feathery things here? These little feathery uh, things on the frame. So this is where a queen has, they've raised the queen cell, she's hatched, and all that, that feathery portion is all that's kind of left of that area where they've uncapped that queen cell and torn it down. So these kind of little feathery remnants of a queen cell tells me that this hive probably did not accept their queen, but they did raise a queen and they probably have a virgin queen somewhere in this hive. So I'm just gonna look a little bit further just out of curiosity. It's hard to do, but sometimes you can actually see the virgin queen running around. If I see queen cells that have hatched, or signs of a queen cell that have, that have hatched, then I'm not terribly concerned. Um, I give them a couple more weeks and see if that virgin will start laying. So, so I don't see any eggs yet. It's still a couple weeks before that virgin queen could lay after we made that split and it looks like they didn't accept their new queen so yeah so we've got no eggs but we do have some hatched queen cells so i'm going to leave this hive another couple of weeks and see if they've got a queen by then and if they don't have a queen in a couple of weeks at that point i'll come back and add a new queen Okay, so this was another hive that, uh, that we split and they did something interesting. We put a deep box on top of that split with uh, pretty much just uh, foundation. And you can see they're starting to draw this foundation out. They've got some nectar stored in it, but they're also, they've drawn out these sheets incorrectly. So when they do this, I usually just tear it off. Um, I scrape off those excess irregular chunks with my hive tool. You can eat the honeycomb if you haven't been treating for mites. And uh, oftentimes I'll turn the frame around and point it back in the other way. And uh, they'll, they'll uh, redraw it out better the next time. Another thing you often see is they drew this frame out way too wide. See how thick that frame is? Um, they Instead of drawing out the frame next to it, they just drew this one out a whole lot thicker. <laughs> and so when they do that, I tend to take this really thick frame that they drew it out 
too thick on and I'll put it on the outside of the box. So I'll stick it way over here on the outside, push it tight up against the wall, and then I'll push some frames back tight up against it. And uh, that just prevents them from making the matter worse. Um, and then over time, they'll often kind of reduce back down the size of that uh, overdrawn out honeycomb. Okay, and I know you can't see my head very well, but I want you to really see this hive. This is a double deep hive. This is a good example of a hive that we, we got it, some honey off of. We pulled 30 or 40 pounds off of it. We didn't split it. And so this is what I would consider just a good, healthy summertime hive. Two deep boxes has not been split. Um, it's just good. I mean, you've got several frames in this top brood box that have good brood in it. And it's hard to tell. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about, we often talk about summer brood and that's where the brood just, you know, especially in Texas, just gets a little spotty. Um, the queen doesn't lay as much as she does in the spring and they tend to lay around stores and around pollen and around nectar. And so we've got, you know, some scatterings of cat brood here, uh, but we've also got a lot of eggs and larva uh, that I'm really happy with. I'm not seeing a lot of stored pollen, but we are giving them pollen patty. And here's a good frame. So there's a good frame of cat brood. And we'll, I always like to show this hive is practicing some hygienic behavior where you can actually see these pupa that the bees are uncapping. So here's one right here, the pupa that the bees are uncapping. Let's see. And that's, uh, you know, due to varroa mites. Here's a couple more up here where the bees have uh, begun to uncap those pupa that are infected with varroa mites. And so that's, that's fairly common to see this time of year um, as those varroa mite populations increase. It's a good sign that your hive has hygienic uh, practices, that have hygienic genetics, um, but it also means you've got varroa mites. <laughs> so it's kind of a catch-22. It doesn't mean your hive's just gonna take care of the problem on its own. It might, but when I see them starting to un uncap those pupa, um, kind of in that randomized pattern, uh, then I definitely do a varroa mite test. And we, we did a varroa mite test on this hive um, a couple weeks ago, and it, it was very high of varroa mites. And so we've got our treatment in the hive. But this is a good hive. Uh, we've got our treatments in place. I've got a pollen patty on them. They've got about 35 to 40 pounds of honey, I'd say, stored up in the second box. The bottom box is pretty full of bees. So this hive is just rocking and rolling. I mean, all I'm gonna do to this hive um, is I'll probably give them another pollen patty here in a couple days when this one's gone. And then I'll pull these Apivar strips out um, after 40 days and do another varroa mite test and make sure it works. And this hive ought to be great through the winter. So that's just a really good hive with no issues that uh, should be an awesome hive next spring. So that's it for today. I mean, really the name of the game this time of year is control your varroa mites, which starts with monitoring your varroa mites. Um, make sure your hive has enough food. You're going for about 30 pounds of honey or syrup in your second brew box. And then if you're seeing less than a half a frame of cumulative pollen, then go ahead and give them a pollen patty every couple of weeks just to keep that queen laying. Uh, we're not trying to make her explode beyond seasonal norms. Uh, we just want her to continue laying so that population stays high going into the winter and they've got the nutrition they need uh, to raise healthy baby bees because the bees that are raised over the late summer are the bees that have to survive all winter long. So it's really important that they're taken care of nutritionally. And that's about it. I mean, other than that, make sure all your hives have at least two boxes instead of one. That helps them keep them cooler. Um, and monitor, if you're gonna, if you need to requeen, this is a great time of year to do it, uh, August. Um, or if you need to um, do a split, you still could for a super strong hive, 
but in most cases I like to finish up my splits in uh, early July. It's getting a little bit late in the season unless you've got a hive that is just you know 10 12 frames of brood and you can give you know five or six frames of brood to each split otherwise I'd save that uh, till spring. So that's it. I mean uh, the weather's good. I mean it's not been terribly hot yet. Uh, we've still got some blooming plants so there's still a trickle of pollen coming in so some hives may not need any excess pollen substitute fed to them but some areas are getting pretty dry and the pollen stores are all dying so those areas uh, will need some some pollen to keep that queen really going along so there you go so let's talk about in uh, let's talk about august tips so let's talk about a few things that were not covered in that video um, and then we'll jump into uh, solar wax melters in just a moment so summer blooms, you know, these are, this is the same slide as last month. We're still kind of seeing the, the sunflowers are blooming, uh, the uh, sumac, the um, uh, crepe myrtles, you know, we're still seeing some really healthy summer blooms. The honey harvest for pretty much everyone in the South is completely over. You should have already harvested your honey. And if you haven't, you need to do that immediately. And I'll show you why in just a minute. But most folks I've talked to on the whole agree that this was one of the worst honey crops for the South that they've ever seen. Um, so it was, I mean, commercially, you know, we usually, I usually produce, you know, uh, you know, a good strong hive will do 80, 90 pounds. Um, and, you know, this year it was more like 20 pounds. So just a pretty terrible crop overall. Um, but if you haven't extracted your honey, you need to do so quickly. This little gem is uh, snow on the mountain or snow on the prairie, depending on what area you're from. And it's an awesome summer nectar and pollen source for bees. It's a wonderful bee plant. The disadvantage of it, if you've been beekeeping long, you know, is that it makes your honey uh, burn your throat as you eat the honey. Not, not, it's not spicy, you know, you don't really taste it when you put it in your mouth, but once you swallow honey from the snow on the mountain plant, it kind of burns your throat in an unpleasant way. So, um, you know, most of the, most of the areas in Texas and the South, this starts blooming now. I mean, it, I saw a lot of it in bloom over the past couple of days, and you really want to have your honey pulled off before that starts blooming so you don't get that hot spicy honey uh, in your good honey. Now, if you, um, you know, it, it, again, this is a good plant. It's a great summer nectar and pollen source for bees. So current conditions, what are we seeing right now? The honey flow is completely over. Uh, there's a summer and nectar pollen trickle, um, but it is really starting to slow down. Some areas have gotten some really good rain. Some of you poor folks in Southeast Texas, it has never stopped raining uh, since, uh, you know, 2018, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, some areas in North Texas have gotten some good rains. Other areas are getting pretty dry. Um, Austin area, you know, kind of some of the areas have gotten really good rain. Some areas it's getting really dry. So overall, you know, uh, Southeast Texas aside, you know, we're kind of seeing a progressive drying out um, and uh, less and less natural nectar and pollen coming in. So if we continue to get occasional rains, we could be set up for a great fall honey flow. We had so much rain in the spring uh, and we're still getting some decent rains in a lot of the states. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we may be able to have a decent fall honey flow. We'll see. We'll keep you posted on that. Inside summer hives, what should you expect to see? You know, we, we took a tour through a lot of those in the video, but this, these are the types of frames of brood that I'm seeing. You know, we, we, I'll talk about summer brood a little bit later tonight, but the brood tends to, the, the queen stops laying so much. They don't need the population they needed as they were producing honey uh, in surplus. And so the population of a hive is going to start shrinking. There's going to be less brood. You're probably going to have more like six to eight frames of brood in a strong, healthy hive. And, you know, you may have 10 to 12 frames of bees instead of 16 frames of bees. And then the brood might start looking a little more spotty, um, kind of like you see in these images. And that's all pretty normal for this time of year. 
This is just a reminder, um, in case you didn't know, that the varroa mites are the leading cause of hive death, and the varroa population typically hits critical levels in July and August. So, you know, what, the, what varroa mites typically do is they don't immediately kill your bees, but they weaken your hive and introduce viruses that eventually kill your bees at some point in the fall or winter. But the problem started back now in July and August when those varroa mite levels got out of control. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that we have a whole varroa mite management class for $29 that you can stream on our website. And it talks about uh, organic controls, chemical controls, integrative pest management, et cetera, to teach you how to, how to manage mites. So speaking of mites, I wanted to talk about this because a lot of folks have questions about it, but we call it um, bald brood. And this is when the bees are uncapping uh, pupa inside the hive. So this is capped brood that the bees have retroactively, after they capped it, they pulled the capping back off because there's some sort of a problem. Now, a lot of folks say, well, this is a good thing because it's hygienic behavior, right? They're pulling that capping off because varroa mites are in there and they're gonna pull the varroa mites and the bee out and rid the hive of mites. Well, bald brood is really technically usually caused by um, one of two things. One is uh, what you see in this image is actually from a wax moth and wax moth larva will get underneath the honeycomb and they'll tunnel through the honeycomb. And as they do so, the bees are uncap those cells that the, 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 the worm is under to try to remove it. And then it's also damaging the, uh, the pupa. The difference is if you see, when I see uncapped pupa in straight lines, as you can see in these images, you know, you've got these, um, I should say linear, uh, these linear patterns, as you could imagine, a worm tunneling through uh, these cells. That's, that's what I, that's usually wax moths, not the bees are uncapping it due to varroa mites uh, underneath the cappings. And you typically only see this type of bald brood on weak hives that aren't able to fully defend themselves from wax moths. So usually it's hives, you know, four to six frames of bees or less. So here we go. So that linear pattern, here's another example of it. You can kind of see the, the wax moth larva went under here and it turned and went this way. It's kind of this linear pattern. You kind of, this picture shows it really well, but you can kind of see this raised lip around the cell, that's often an indicator that it's a wax moth and not a varroa mite issue. And typically, yeah, found in smaller, weaker hives. Now the solution to this, this isn't a big deal. When it's wax moths like this, it, it's, it's not necessarily a big deal. The wax moths aren't gonna damage enough pupa to really hurt the hive, but it could be an indicator that your hive is struggling and you know small hive beetles and wax moths could move in and make a bigger mess. So if you're seeing this, it's a good idea to maybe give them a frame of brood from a stronger hive. Um, look closely, make sure you've got a good laying queen, make sure they've got the food and resources they need. And we'll, we'll talk about how to boost up weaker hives in, in just a minute. Hygienic behavior, which is when the bees are actually removing pupa due to varroa mites, there's typically not a linear pattern. And so you kind of saw in that video at the beginning, you know, we, we saw some cells and it wasn't in any sort of a linear pattern. You know, the cells appear more chewed down and it indicates a hive is removing larva or pupa infected with varroa. It's a positive trait. It's good to see hygienic behavior in bees. It also means you've got a varroa mite uh, issue typically when the bees are really practicing a lot of hygienic behavior. So my encouragement is if you're seeing this test and see what the levels are. And if they're sky high, you know, if they're over a couple, you know, if they're over two or three per hundred bees, you may want to consider a treatment. And then just as a reminder, you know, there's the varroa threat trends. So you can see that threat level climbs and really peaks in July, August, and September. Um, so make sure you're paying attention to your varroa mites. Really quickly, summer trickle feeding, how should we be feeding right now? So my recommendation at this point if, is that if you're seeing, as far as pollen substitute, if you're seeing less than a cumulative half frame of pollen stored in your hive, 
um, then begin feeding two one pound patties per month uh, to each hive. It's not going to hurt them. Um, it's just going to make sure they've got the nutrition they need to raise those healthy winter bees. And then sugar syrup, you know, if your bees don't have 30 ish pounds of honey or syrup stored in the second box, then go ahead and feed them a fourth to a half a gallon per week until they've got that 30 or 40 pounds stored in the second box. And then you can stop. So there's just a quick summary of summer care, you know, maintain that 30 to 40 pound surplus over the entire summer. Um, add pro health when you're feeding syrup, that gives the bees a great little boost. Test for mites, feed a couple pollen patties. I do recommend feeding pro DFM, it's a my, uh, probiotic and it's a great product. I use it commercially constantly and it really just cleans up any brood that may have disease in it. And then you can equalize brood between hives if needed. And we talked about that a lot in our July webinar, which you can check out uh, the recording of on our website. Another quick note, don't forget to water your bees. If you do not have a pond or creek or lake within a quarter mile or so of your bees, then provide some water for them. Or if you live in urban areas, it's a good idea to provide them a water source so they don't uh, go into your neighbor's swimming pool looking for water. So, you know, it can be as simple as uh, a five gallon bucket, half full of gravel with water dripping into it out off of a water hose or a water faucet. Uh, the bees aren't picky. They don't really like clean water. They like dirty water. So doesn't have to be clean. They love bird baths. They love kitty pools with, you know, carpet floating in it. Um, you know, anything that the bees can land on is helpful for them. Speaking of water, navigating the heat is an often tricky thing in Texas. And a lot of folks are worried about their bees over the summer. Um, I, I found these really cool, cheap temperature probes uh, off of Amazon that you can uh, stick inside the hive and you can see the temperature in the center of the hive. And so I did this and we've got a video on our YouTube channel uh, that kind of goes over the whole little experiment that I did. But it's looking at different hives in different situations and what the internal temperature was. And these two different pictures are showing this 100 degree hive was had two boxes. This 105 degree hive just had one box. And that's often what I see is if you just have one box for your hive in the Texas summer with no shade, they're going to overheat. You know, 105, that's overheating for, for a beehive. If you've got two boxes on, they typically withstand the full sun, no problem. So the biggest takeaway there is, you know, make sure you've got at least two boxes on all your bees to keep them from overheating. When to work bees in the summer heat, I recommend working bees early in the morning or late in the evening for both your and your bees sake. Uh, don't try, like I mentioned in the video, don't try to gauge hive population in the heat of the day. The bees are often running. They're maybe out of the hive, underneath the hive. You know, you do that early in the morning. Um, don't leave frames exposed to direct sunlight in the heat of the day for more than 30 seconds. I've literally had times where, you know, I've set a frame out in the heat of the day when it's a 9,800 degree day, the sun melts that beeswax in a minute or less. Uh, and of course, killing any brood uh, that is in that frame or melting the honey out of the frame. So just be cognizant, you know, don't, don't spread frames all over the place when you're doing an inspection when it's, you know, super hot. Um, if you have to do an inspection during the heat of the day. And then finally, you know, don't spend more than five or 10 minutes per hive inspecting them if you're inspecting in the heat of the day. Again, it's just you're disrupting the bees airflow and their circulation when you're breaking that hive apart. So just make sure that you try to keep inspections relatively quickly if you're doing it in the heat of the day. If you do it early in the morning, no problem. Something you're gonna see is increased bearding and reduced flight as it gets hotter and hotter. And that's pretty normal. So if you see a lot of bearding going on in your hives, you might go out there early in the morning and see if, there's, if their top box is completely full of bees. If their top box is completely full of bees, they're not gonna swarm this time of year typically, but sometimes I'll still put another box uh, on top just to give them room and keep them a little cooler. And then you're not going to see them flying as much when it gets really hot. I mean, like us, they, they don't exactly want to go exercise in the heat. And 
frankly, there's not much for them to do anyway. There's not a whole lot for them to forage. I'm going to skip that one for the sake of time. Last thing I want to touch on before we move on to uh, the rest of the speakers is fixing weak hives. And this is something that actually is very important this time of year, because believe it or not, we've only got two to two and a half months left of growing season for bees. You know, once we get into early to mid-October, depending on the year, the bees just completely stop growing typically. And you really have a hard time getting a hive to grow past that point. So if you've got weak beehives, now is the time to work on them. And we'll talk about this in more depth in September. But really quickly, you know, how to assess the strength of the hive. How do you know if you've got a weak hive? You know, a frame, we often count it by frames of bees. You know, a frame of bees is a deep frame covered two thirds front and back with bees. Now, again, that's early in the morning. So if you try to gauge that population in the heat of the day, it's gonna be off. So that's early in the morning. The fastest method for counting frames of bees is right when you open the lid or right when you break the boxes apart, you know, look down between those frames as you can kind of see in these pictures and you can get a pretty good count pretty fast of how many frames of bees you've got. In general, I say less than a deep box full of bees, less than one deep box full of bees, I would consider on the weaker side most of the times of the year. Certainly this time of year, if I've got, if my hive cumul cumulatively has less than one deep box full of bees, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some action to boost up their strength a bit. My sweet spot this time of year is a box and a half to two boxes you know, both 80 to 90% full of bees. That's kind of my goal. That's my goal going into winter as well. And so you can kind of see here, this is just the high growth trends in the South, more or less, that we often see. And you've got um, frames, of, um, frames of bees over here on the left. So these left-hand numbers are frames of bees. And then the yellow column is your goal. And gray column means work and the red orange column is beyond saving. And so we're in August here. So my goal is to have at least 10 frames of bees in each of my hives. And if it's under that, if it's like seven, so less than that box full of bees, it needs work. If it's, you know, two or three frames of bees, I say it's beyond saving. I mean, if you requeen and baby them perfectly, they might make it. It's just really hard to get a hive to grow in the summer. Um, and so if they're, if they're less than that, it's pretty iffy they're going to work. So how do you save a weak hive? Um, add brood. So get a frame of brood from a stronger hive and put it in the very center. Um, you can add bees. You can go back and watch our July webinar if you want to see how to do that. Make sure the varroa are under control because it doesn't matter how much brood you give a hive that's dying from varroa mites, it's not going to save them. So make sure your varroa mites are under control. If they need it, feed syrup and feed pollen substitute. A starving hive isn't gonna be able to grow or thrive. And then finally feed probiotics and essential oils to a weak hive. So it's kind of a um, throw, the kitchen sink, throw the kitchen sink at it approach. I mean, it's doing everything you can to boost up those weaker hives and now's the time to do it. And if we wait until September, October, especially October, it's going to be getting a little bit late. So, okay, so with that uh, summary of monthly tips, so I want to um, explain a couple things that are going to happen now. So our intent was that we would then, uh, we would go to break in a breakout room style where you would choose what speaker and what room you want to listen to, and then you can listen to that uh, speaker. Now, the technology failed us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we did a trial run about an hour before the webinar started and it totally failed. And, uh, and it was just, it was a mess. So what we're going to do is we're, we're just going to do each one of these in kind of rapid succession right here on this webinar. So there won't be a breakout room, but we are going to cover all these topics. Dodie's going to go first and then James and Sherry, and then I'll wrap us up with how to requeen hives couple side notes, I um, uh, apologize for that mix up, but I think this will work just fine. 
we might go a little bit long tonight um, because we've got three speakers. Now we're each going to be trying to talk quickly, but we might go a little bit long. All of this is being recorded, and that recording will be posted on our website, posted on our YouTube account, and emailed out. So if you know if we hit that eight o'clock mark and I'm only halfway through with requeening, I'm just going to go ahead and finish. Um, so we've got that recording, and if you need to log off, totally understand. So. Um, and then maybe by next month, we will have the tech worked out to um, do breakout sessions where you can actually just choose, hey, I want to listen to this person or this person. Um, you don't have to listen to all of it. So quick side note before we go to Dodi, um, our September guest speaker will be Randy Oliver. So if you're new to beekeeping, you probably don't know Randy. His website is scientificbeekeeping.com. Highly recommend you check it out. Um, he is a very smart beekeeper, scientist, researcher, and uh, he is a one of the most sought after speakers in the country. And so we'll we'll do our normal uh, first 30, 40 minutes of updates on what's going on. And then Randy's going to be talking about, uh, we haven't picked the topic yet, but it's going to be something to do with practical summer management of your bees. So that will be in our September meeting. Okay, Dodie, if you are ready, then feel free to steal the screen from me and share your PowerPoint. And uh, Dodie's going to be talking about solar wax melting, which is awesome. And Texas is an awesome place to do solar wax melting because we've got plenty of uh, solar going on. So Dodie, I will turn it over to you and uh, mute myself. All right. So let me pull this up real fast, make sure everybody can see it. Can y'all see it? Yes, Dodie, we sure can. All right, excellent. So how many people cringed when you saw Blake just chunk those pieces of honeycomb off on the side? Oh man, <laughs> so save that, save that. Okay, so where do you get your wax from? Your bees make your honeycomb, all right? And there's lots of different types of honeycomb. Make sure that you don't uh, mix it all into one big, one big bucket. And if you do, you're going to have to treat that one big bucket as the lowest common denominator. So your best wax is going to be this brand new wax or this stuff that is that you uncap your honeycomb with, your honey with. That's going to be the best stuff. The worst honeycomb you get is going to be the stuff that the babies are born in because that's full of cocoons, right? And then you've got a couple of different layers in between there. But if you can, keep your wax separated. That'll help you down the line with using it for different things. Just real fast, I want to let everybody know that beeswax comes from your worker bees, your little girls in there. Um, they have glands in their abdomens. I know the first time I saw a little girl bee with white things coming out of her stomach. I thought she was about to die. So it's good to see a picture so that you see exactly what that looks like. Um, the wax glands develop in, in the girl bees that are between 12 and 20 days old, and then they start to atrophy. So they're not there all the time. Um, nice healthy bees can produce eight scales of wax every 12 hours. If you gotta have four things, you gotta have your bees have to be the right age. The temperature has to be warm enough. There has to be some place in the hive to build a comb and um, your bees have to have a constant source of nectar or you have to be feeding them sugar syrup. Wax is a super resource, ex uh, resource expensive uh, kind of item for them to make. They have to consume about 10 pounds of honey to produce a single pound of wax, 10 pounds of honey. So it, think, about, think about losing 10 pounds of honey just so you can get some wax. Now, now that's another reason why you wanna cringe when, when you see Blake just shoveling that chunk of honeycomb off to the side. Um, one more slide of other bee facts. It takes a thousand scales to make one gram of beeswax. And remember, they only make it every eight hours. Um, approximately 500,000 scales to make a pound of wax. And your deep frames, they are about 
um, a third of a pound of wax. So you can see again how resource expensive it is. Um, so what we're, what we're here to do is figure out how to get it from our frames into these nice little blocks of, of wax. Um, really super easy to do this. There are two different methods. One is using a solar wax, well, there's more than two. One is using a wax melter, a solar wax melter, which is super easy to do, especially with all this sun in Texas. And the other one is to use a crock pot. You can also do this in your oven, but uh, why mess up your oven? Um, you don't need any really fancy tools. You don't have to go out and spend $100 on a solar wax melter. Um, everybody has a hive body. And if you don't have a hive body, then you can probably find a, um, a nice little styrofoam container, a styrofoam ice chest. Uh, check around and see if anybody that you know is getting those uh, meals delivered or if anybody's getting any medication delivered. So a lot of the times those come in these um, styrofoam boxes that are perfect. If not, like I said, if you have a, a nice still well put together hive body, uh, especially if the bees have been in it recently and have propolized all the inside, then that will work too. Just set it down on a nice flat surface. Here I have it on just a lid. It's snug right in there. Um, because I don't really want, to, I want to have a waterproof area. My, my uh, styrofoam bucket's gonna work fine, but in a box, it's not waterproof. I need to drip some water. So I'm going to put a big old roaster pan in there. That you can get just from the dollar store. They have big old aluminum turkey roaster pans. So put that in the bottom. All right. Next thing is some hardware cloth. Um, I just got a really inexpensive piece. And you can tell it's kind of yellowish. I've been using it over and over and over again. It fits perfectly in my solar melter. You can just bend it and cut it so that it fits. I actually put in a little block of wood right there in the middle because it kind of started to uh, droop. So uh, make sure you don't let it droop so much. So there's my, my piece of hardware cloth. All right. And there's my little block of wood in my really gummy, nasty looking uh, um, insulated ice chest, but styrofoam chest, but it's it doesn't matter and you can reuse it forever. I'm still using the same one. So I have my piece of hardware cloth and it's shaped like a little U and it's sitting on top of that wood block. And then you layer one layer of paper towels. And I thought, oh, if one layer is good, two is even better. No, it's not. One layer is all you need. So one layer of paper towel from side to side and then just dump all of your wax on there and you can pile it really high. All right, the next thing you're gonna do is go to your thrift store, Goodwill or something like that, and look for a picture, a glass picture frame. And you don't care what the picture is because we're really looking for that glass. You can see I still have the wire uh, left on mine. Um, so you can get, you can get real in, really inexpensive uh, picture frames. Just make sure that you know about how big your ice chest is your styrofoam container so that you make sure that your glass is bigger than that. And I promise I only spent, I, I didn't spend more than $5 on mine. Really, really inexpensive. And then set your alarm on your phone for every hour, maybe every hour and a half and go outside and check real fast and make sure that your, your contraption is staying in the sun. Before you put it all together though, the reason why it needs to be waterproof is you need to put some water inside your ice chest because when your wax melts and drips through the filter that is your paper towels, you want it to land not on the bottom of your bucket, but drip into some water and then it'll float on top of the water and then you'll get this nice little pile of wax and look at how pretty and yellow it is. You won't, you wouldn't think, and that's exactly what I got from these because I took all the pictures right after each other. So it went in looking kind of dirty looking and it was still full of honey and, and not pretty. And it came out and it was just gorgeous. Look at how yellow that is. 
and just by dripping it right through that um, paper towel there. So your next uh, method for getting it out is using a crock pot. And for when I, I use my crock pot more if I have big chunks of uh, wax, not just my little cappings, those melt really easy in the, in the solar waxer. The cappings will melt too, it'll just take a little bit longer. Um, but what you do for the um, crock pot method is you wrap them all up in some cheesecloth and you're just gonna melt them with, again, with water in your crock pot. You'll let it cool, it has to cool overnight. And I know it's really tempting to go in and poke and play with it because that's me. I was the girl that was constantly playing in the wax. Um, try not to mess with it. Let it harden up overnight. And then the next morning you can uh, pop it on the side and um, you'll be able to pull it out of your crock pot and clean off the bottom of it and do this whole process again. So it's, it's a multiple process thing, a multiple step through of pouring it back through and you pour it back through. You can see in this picture that I, I get down to a sheet. I, again, a thrift store item, I bought a big white sheet and I cut it all up into big squares. So after um, it's melted through the cheesecloth, I go, you can even go through a t-shirt. And my last thing is through this, um, it's a really high thread count sheet. So you get the very last little bits of dirt from your wax here. Drop all of your, your honeycomb and your pieces of wax in this bucket or inside your, your sheet and then inside your crock pot, make sure there's some water in there and get it to just melting. And as soon as it's melting, turn it off and let it harden. It's gonna harden like a chunk, like you see here. And you just, um, oh, when it's, I'm sorry, you, you're gonna need to pick that up by the edges and let it all drain into. So when it, as soon as it gets melted, pick it all up, pick the, pick the sheet up, pull it up and let it drip and it'll drip for a little while. Um, don't touch it. Don't try to squeeze it out with your hands because it's hot, 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 hot. If you have some tongs though, those work great. Um, like barbecue tongs, you can squish it with those. Um, and then once you have just your uh, crock pot, just full of the wax, it'll, it'll solidify and it'll look like this middle picture. You're gonna scrape off any of that dirt that might be on the bottom and do the whole process again. Again, stick it back in your in an in a clean part of your sheet and add water and melt it again. Eventually, this round block will come out really clean and there won't be any more dirt to scrape off. That's when you get it and you can pour it into your molds. Right. So there's different types of beeswax. Like I said at the beginning, you have brand new uh, burk home and you have uh, the cappings from your untreated supers, that piece of, it's gonna be drawn comb under there. Um, you also have treated honeycomb and then you have old brood comb that's been treated. So keep your wax separate because there's different things that you can do with different types of wax. Your brand new pretty burr comb, untreated uh, comb from your honey supers, that that's the stuff that you can use like cosmetically, close to your face, close to your body. You can use it for lip balm. Um, you can use it for salve. You can use it for beeswax uh, and honey soaps. You can use it for hand cream and hand lotion and sea salt scrub. If you have treated, um, cleaned but treated comb, it can be used, you know, it's not something since it was treated, it's not something you want to put on your body, but there's still plenty of things you can do with it. You can use it to make candles, um, wood polish. You can waterproof your matches and waterproof your boots, uh, waterproof your tarps and all kinds of things. You can use it for leather treatments and you can coat nails and wooden screws for easier application. The very old nasty dirty brood comb, um, you can use it for encaustics it, as a paint medium. You can use it as a marine quality putty. Um, Bastique is another type of uh, art you can do with it. It, it needs wax. Um, you can also rub it on your drawers and it'll make them slide easier. So there's lots of things you can do with your beeswax. 
um, depending on what kind of wax it is. Um, the reasons why we love to have beeswax and, and use it for so many different things is that it's a great carrier. Um, uh, I mean, a great barrier and it helps to seal in moisture. It's anti-inflammatory, antibacterial and antifungal. It provides protections against environmental, environmental irritants and allergens. Beeswax has vitamin A in it and it also helps to improve hydration and promote cell regeneration. And it's a beneficial thickener for other liquids. Um, some tips you need to keep in mind when you are uh, playing with your beeswax is to use gloves because wax is hot. It's melting hot, very hot, hot, hot. I uh, use pot holders, put an apron on because once you splashed a wax up on your favorite t-shirt, you're never gonna get that spot out. Um, uh, having a temperature, an infrared thermostat, a temperature gun is really cool for checking the temperature. Um, make sure that you have everything ready ahead of time. If you're going to use a double bo boiler or a crock pot, um, measuring cups, anything that you're going to use, it's mark it as this is what I'm using just for my wax. Don't think you can now cook with these same utensils because it's not a good idea. Um, big cautions are to never, ever, ever leave melting wax on a burner. Um, it is flammable. If you can use electric heat, that's, that's the best. Beeswax melts at 144 to 147, and um, it will discolor. It'll start turning ugly shades of brown if you get it over 185, and it will um, just catch fire if you get it up to 400 degrees, so don't do that. Um, if you think you might get anywhere near that hot, um, or if you have an open flame, uh, make sure you know where your fire extinguisher is or have a bag of flour ready to throw on it. Don't throw this under water, okay? Um, make sure you understand how to put out a fire if you need to. Um, wax is hot and it can burn, so don't let it spill on you. Some really good ratios of beeswax to coconut oil for in case you want to make um, lip balm, you want it to be very firm, one-to-one, -one, all the way down to lotion, you want it to be very soft. So one part beeswax to six parts coconut oil. You can tell by just those two, it's the beeswax that makes things harder and it's the coconut oil that makes things softer. So the more coconut oil you have, the softer it's gonna be. And uh, the more beeswax, the harder. So as you're making whatever it is you're making, say you're doing a lotion bar and you try one to three, but you think it's just, it's melting too fast, then you can melt the whole thing down again and add more beeswax to it and put it back in your molds again and try again. So make sure you take good notes, but these are really good starting points. Okay, and that's it. So I did mine 15 minutes. Anybody have any questions? That was amazing, Dodie, thank you. <laughs> I'm so impressed at the speed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has any uh, any questions, then feel free to put them in the Q and A box, and um, Dodie uh, can answer those uh, as the Elums are talking about drone layers. So, um, and here we are. And there you are. Yeah, it is great. It's just like it's like magic, isn't it? <laughs> it's like magic. <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> y'all had great questions. Yeah, thank y'all questions. for the questions. We enjoy answering those. Yeah. All right, so our portion is drone layers. Um, gosh. Who's making all those drones and oh, where are they coming my from? Oh, goodness. What is a drone? <laughs> I like this part best. A drone honeybee has a mother, sisters, <laughs> a grandfather, grandsons, and yet not a father. So for those of us that <laughs> understand that, we take, we take consideration for those who don't Ooh, understand. That it's is just, just work on that. No daddy. <laughs> no daddy. <laughs> Who's your so, daddy? And I like this one. He's a 16 chromosome haploid offspring Gosh. of mom or question mark, is he? Oh no, say it's not so. Could, could he possibly come from his sisters? No, no say it's so. Who is that culprit? <laughs> you know, kind of can be either one. Could be from the mom or it could be from the worker. We really, um, there's times a year that it's a real question. It's a real head scratcher that, well, who is in there? 
that's laying all these drone cells. Who's laying all these drone cells? Well, we know it's, it's obviously they're going to be the queen mm -hmm. that's run out of sperm mm -hmm. or perhaps a virgin queen that mm -hmm. never mated mm -hmm. or they didn't mate properly. Mm -hmm. Or the other option is we've already talked about mm -hmm. are laying, laying workers. workers. Okay. And we've talked about laying workers. We're talking about a lot of laying workers. Right. Well, let's go through each one. So if it's a laying queen, what could be those causes? Just like James said, a queen who's either run out of sperm or has run out of sperm from, or a virgin queen that never made it. Old age could be old age. You know, that's hard to think that, you know, ladies do even bees. Funny thing about a drone laying queen, is that uh, she still lays like a queen and that's typically one mm -hmm. egg per cell. Mm -hmm. It still touches the bottom. It still stands up mm -hmm. straight. Um, but it's very little changes, except that the cell that she's laying in is not a dedicated drone cell mm -hmm. like she would have in, 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 the, mm -hmm. in the balance of her life or, uh, prior to this point in time. That cell was actually made for a worker. Mm -hmm. So when she lays a cell, an egg in it that's unfertilized, a drone emerges and the cell's not large enough to hold it. So we end up with this bumpy, knobby, mm -hmm. awkward looking. It looks, awkward looking it looks frame. wrong. It just looks yeah. wrong. Like she didn't know what she was doing. Um, it also can continue to emit pheromone, um, but I don't want to bypass that first bullet point there. Um, Lays mixed compact brood pattern. You know, it, it, it's still going to look like she's laying properly, but yet it's not. It's, it's going to be this, um, like we said, bumpy and knobby because yeah. some of it's going to be drone brood, some of it's going to be worker brood. We know typically a legitimate uh, drone brood is laid in the, in the perimeters of our colony. Mm -hmm. It's laid between the outer edges mm -hmm. of, of frames, between mm -hmm. upper box, lower box, mm -hmm. uh, along the bottom or the sides. But when it starts showing up in mass numbers in the center, a huge indicator for a, uh, a drone laying queen. That's right. That's right. So laying workers. Um, what's the cause of laying workers? Queenless for more than three weeks. Um, basically the loss of brood pheromone. It's brood pheromone um, that prevents a worker from laying eggs. She can lay eggs. But she has that ability, but she's never made it, right? So we know that she's an unfertilized female. So is when once that brood pheromone is disappears, she's in there going, "Well, I think that I'm going to become queen now." Yeah, that's except a, that there may be thirty of them, or fifty of them, or hundreds. Yeah, the the, the dynamics of the hive change immediately at that mm -hmm. three week mark. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, the brood have all emerged. We know twenty one mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. for a worker to emerge. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the three week mark goes into a time period where a transformation starts occurring on these female worker bees, mm -hmm. where they do begin to develop their ovaries to, to some degree. Mm -hmm. They don't, their, their abdomen or their, their um, abdomen does not extend like a queen, right. but internally they're going through changes. You can't spot her. In other words, she's not, she's not wearing a crown now that says I'm the one, because actually you're gonna have a lot of them that adopt this and they will emit some sort of a mimicked queen pheromone. So it's kind of a problem. So let's let's do some formula here. No queen. Equals no fertilized <laughs> eggs, right? Right, and no fertile eggs, fertilized equals, eggs. Equals no worker bee larva. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Too predictable, wasn't yeah, it? it was. No worker bee larva equals no worker bee brood pheromone. We like talked we about said. that. No worker bee brood pheromone equals no suppression of worker bee ovaries. Mm -hmm. We see what's happening here. Right, Spiraling out of control. And lastly, no suppression of worker bee ovaries. You've got laying workers. So um, it's a problem. So it doesn't, it's not just a matter of requeening. Um, we've got, we've got to identify the problem, but let's, let's talk about the indicators. Multiple eggs per cell. She can't, her little abdomen's not long like a queen's. You know, a queen's got this long slender abdomen that reaches down into the bottom of the cell and she'll lay a perfectly vertical egg. Well, a worker can't do that. She's a little squatty body. So her eggs, as she's shooting them out, they're just kind of going everywhere in the cell. So they're gonna be sideways on the side or even dumped in the bottom. Um, and that's first indicator. Another indicator is that there's multiple eggs per cell. Mm -hmm. Always, it might be two, it might be 14. There's no end to them recognizing uh, what's going on. All they know is to, is to dip. 
Yeah. They, they lay an egg and keep going. Overabundance of drone brood. It's going to be spotty drone, drone brood. It's, it's not going to be any worker brood happening on. Eggs on pollen. If you've never seen eggs on pollen, that's really a unique visual. We had a pretty picture in the magazine of that a couple of months ago. It was gorgeous, gorgeous picture of egg on pollen. And multiple eggs in the queen cup. Now that would be unusual to see, wouldn't it? Well, they're, what they're trying cup. to what they're trying to do is they're trying to replace a queen. They're they're trying all they can do in order to save the colony because they do recognize there's not a queen, or they wouldn't start laying. Well, there so, comes a point in time though where they where they they're not considering whether they're actually trying to create a queen or not. They're just dropping eggs mm -hmm. everywhere. Right, but they could put them in a queen cell, hoping that it's equally as well as another cell. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. So to save or not to save, that is the question. That's a tough one. You know, we talked about that three week period that, that is required for the brood pheromone to dissipate from the colony. And then at the end of the second three weeks, another thing happens. That's when the actual laying begins. So three weeks to create it, the, the uh, event, mm -hmm. and then three more weeks, they reach the point where they can actually lay the eggs. So we're at six weeks. And how long do our bees live during the mm -hmm. spring and summer? Six to seven uh, six, weeks. Yeah. Oh, so all of a sudden our colony population has dwindled mm -hmm. rapidly, except for the drones. So yeah. do we save or don't we save? A lot of that has to do with what is the balance of that population. Mm -hmm. That's so true. If you don't have the bees in there, then it may not be worth saving. It sure may not, just like the slide says. So the only way to save the bees, the only way to save this colony is to get rid of the laying worker. Um, suppress her to suppress her ovaries and we have to do that to suppress, differently suppress their ovaries that's what i said that's suppress right. their ovaries you cannot simply requeen possible remedies identify who's the culprit who is that culprit if it's worker or failing queen so we talked about that and, and blake again is going to talk about requeening at mm -hmm. the end of this session that's right, that's so right. y'all hang with us here good point good point failing queen find and kill the queen if not shake all the bees off 20 feet away this is important that you do this away from its original hive. You want them to have to fly back and find that location, right? The bees themselves. Remove drone frames. You don't want to keep an overabundance of drone frames in there for- That's right, pull, pull, that, pull the frames of, of excess drone brood out, do whatever you want with it, feed it to your chickens, uh, leave it out in the open and let nature take care mm -hmm. of it but it's time to get those out of there because they're just going to emerge and increase that drone population. That's right. Um, and then replace those with new frames to the outside of the brood nest, not in the center. And then add one frame of combination brood to the center. And that's important because we're recreating the brood nest. Mm -hmm. So we're adding those new, new frames of foundation. It can be open foundation or it can be drawn cone. It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter, but they go to the outside. They don't go back where those drone frames came from originally. Mm -hmm. And then requeen in 24 hours, taking that same protocol that you would if you were requeening just in a standard um, ordeal of requeening, like Blake's going to talk about in a little bit. All right, so that was queen. So we've got to get rid of the queen and then we requeen. That's how you do that to, to, for a failing queen. Laying worker. This is a little more tricky. We've got other, other options for that. Uh, shake all the bees. We talked about that on this last one, but we're going to shake all the bees out 20 feet away. This is all girls, remember, we don't have a, we don't have a worker bees. We don't have a queen in there. We're gonna shake all of those bees out 20 feet away. Again, remove all the drone frames. And I'm gonna point out something here, not only so you don't have an overabundance of drones, but because that's a mite bomb. That is one of the primary cells that varroa mites like to reproduce in. So you don't want those emerging and just being a, a mite bomb in your colony. That's, that's true. Not and then we'll continue with the same process, replace with mm -hmm. new frames to the outside, add a frame of combination brood mm -hmm. to the center. Mm -hmm. We don't want all cat brood. We don't want all open brood. So we want to stagger this so we have a new population right. occurring and then requeen in 24 hours. That's right. Well, we're talking about requeening by the colony itself doing that, check the queen cells. Mm -hmm. Oh, and they will, they will, they'll start to do that. So really make sure you, and Blake, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but you can't just stick a, a queen uh, cage with a new queen in it if there's queen cells in there. Uh, method number two for laying workers, remove the excess drone brood frames, we've said that before, Combine with a queen right colony using a double screen for separation. You see that picture in the top right hand corner up there? That's called a double screen and it's just for that. It has a 
as the name implies, has a screen on the top and the bottom where there's an airspace in between. And it allows the time for the queen pheromone that's in the bottom of the queen rock colony to emit up into that top box that was the laying worker. And what in theory that does is it suppresses those ovary, uh, the, the worker bees from producing ovaries producing well, ovaries, it allows, eggs, It allows the box to, to stabilize and it go does. back to its original position. So it's a possible way of doing it. It is. Uh, just leave it there uh, until you notice that uh, the drone are all gone, things have stabilized. Mm -hmm. uh, your bees will probably start using it for some sort of a nectar storage super. <laughs> Good. And uh, we'll just see what happens. And once it's fully stabilized, uh, you can leave it there, pull that double screen out if you want to or make a split. It's not likely that you would make a split this the same year yeah. because the bee population would have a hard time recovering that quickly, but it can be treated as a regular colony at that time, but do pull that double screen out. Yes. And the idea of the double screen is obviously to prevent any queen stinging from taking place when any, anything's occurring from, from recreation of a new queen. Yeah. Uh, method three, uh, switch hive locations with a strong queen right colony. So let's say it's this colony that's the queen less, just reverse its location with the one that is, has a queen. The, um, and remove the excess drone brood frames. We keep saying that because obviously that's important. In a matter of 48 hours, those workers that are coming in from foragers should correct the issue. I really like this method. The, yeah. the concept is really great in that, you know, we know that a given colony will allow will allow foragers in from another colony mm -hmm. if they're bearing fruit or their labor. You know, if they're, if they're carrying <laughs> yeah. pollen, if they're carrying nectar, and they'll, if, even if they're from another colony, but a, a bee that's coming in empty mm -hmm. is rejected if it doesn't belong to that colony. Well, that, that stable colony, the queen rock colony, is gonna reject those, those laying workers uh, because they do not have the queen pheromone. They are not bringing in nectar. They're not bringing in pollen. pollen and pollen and they'll actually, if any of them do slip in and start laying eggs, they'll consume those eggs. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll pull them out, they'll dump them, they'll Clean consume them if they want the, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, protein from it. And that occurs on a, on a daily and weekly basis anyway within a colony. There are always some uh, drone layer workers, but the natural process of a colony is to clean it up so we don't, we don't typically see it. Yeah. And that will happen with this like, method number three. It will. So the takeaway, and this is our last slide, Blake, just so you know, um, frequent hive checks. The number one cause of this going way south is that we're not getting in there and recognizing it when it happens, whether that queen is failing or whether you've got a laying worker. Either one needs to be addressed right away or the problem just keeps getting worse and worse. And you could, literally can lose a colony from either one of those issues, either one of those culprits. And requeen yearly, keeping a young new queen absolutely makes all the difference because a non, young new queen will be focused on not swarming, building brood, and creating a workforce. So that's a wonderful segue for Blake. To Blake. <laughs> awesome. There you go, Blake. So that's all yours. You tell everybody how to, to requeen. That was perfect. You guys uh, <laughs> uh, are killing it on uh, the timing and uh, the intros. Um, okay, let me get mine pulled up here, and here we go. And let's talk about requeening. So we've got about 15 minutes left, which is right on schedule. Thank you so much to Dodie and James and Sherry for uh, just nailing it on the timing. I'll, I'll try to do the same thing so we can get everybody out of here on time. But the Elams did a great uh, job of prefacing why it's so important to requeen. And I recommend requeening every year to prevent things like drone layers from happening in the first place. But when it comes time to requeen your hive, the, the first and often most challenging thing to do is finding your old queen to kill her or remove her to add a new queen into the hive. Um, I recommend requeening your hive every spring or every summer. We'll focus on the summer right now because it's summer um, proactively so don't wait until you have a drone layer don't wait until there's a problem go ahead and proactively on a schedule requeen every year and that's going to eliminate so many potential problems in your hives and uh, so just getting used to doing that every year is going to save you from a lot of headache 
Um, for the sake of time, we have several uh, in the follow-up email that we send out to this webinar. We'll include links to several videos that show how to find a queen. All those videos are also on our YouTube channel and on our website. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on how to find that queen before you're going to kill her and replace her because we've got a lot of awesome resources out there for doing that. As we kind of think about requeening, let's talk briefly about spring versus summer requeening. Which one is preferred? The pros for spring requeening is that the hive gets a sudden burst of strength before the honey flow. Anytime you requeen a hive, whether it's spring or summer, that new queen is typically going to lay more faster and better than an older queen. And so you're, you know, a month or so after you've introduced a new queen, you're going to see an explosion of population. So if you requeen in early April, you'll get that explosion of population in early May, right when the honey flow is beginning and your bees are going to make more honey. Um, if you're requeen in the summer, you know, July, August, then you're going to get that burst of bees in September, right when they're getting ready to go into winter. So, you know, the pro of spring is you might make more honey if you requeen. The pro of summer is that you're going to potentially have a healthier hive over winter if you requeen in the summer. Um, another pro of the springtime is it's easier to get bees to accept a new queen in the spring. Uh, bees are uh, more, more readily accept new queens when there's a honey flow, uh, a strong or at least a decent honey trickle and a good pollen flow. They're just more apt to accept those queens. The pros of the summer requeening is queens are more readily available to purchase. The, everyone wants queens in April and, and it's hard to get queens in April because the demand is so high. If you wait till August, September, you know, July, August, September, it's really easy to find queens and they're often cheaper uh, because they're so readily available and the demand isn't there. And then of course, like I mentioned, that hive gets a sudden boost of strength going into winter. If you're trying to decide whether or not to requeen your hive, uh, you know, if, one of the classic things we often look for is brood pattern. You know, is the brood really spotty? Is it kind of that shotgun pattern? You saw some good examples of that from James and Sherry. Uh, or is it a nice compact solid pattern? One thing you've got to be careful of is that in the summer, like I mentioned, that brood often starts looking a little more spotty and that's pretty normal. So how do you tell the difference between spotty summer brood and a failing queen. Um, there's a couple key things, you know, spotty summer brood usually still has some areas on frames that have a nice compact solid pattern. And you know, this brood pattern isn't bad. It's a little spotty, but it's not terrible. Um, a failing queen is going to have a terrible brood pattern across all the frames. And, and that's typically, you know, an indicator that, oh, she's failing. It's not like she was laying around resources and oh, there's some good brood patterns over here. It's like, no, it's all spotty. It all looks rough. And that's an indicator you absolutely need to requeen. But again, what I'm recommending is do it preventatively. So requeen on a schedule every year, kind of no matter how your queen looks, because just because you look at a hive and she has a great pattern and they seem healthy, doesn't mean they're gonna be a month from now. And if your hive goes queenless in October, or September after everyone has stopped selling queens, you're not going to be able to, you know, save that hive. Okay, so on a very practical level, how to, you know, what was the first steps to requeening? So, what I really recommend for summer requeening is feed your hive, whether they need it or not. Feed them uh, about a fourth of a to a half of a gallon of syrup every couple of days starting a couple days before you introduce that new queen, keep feeding for about a week to 10 days after you introduce that queen because you're simulating, replicating that natural nectar flow in the spring, which makes bees more apt to accept that queen. So start feeding a couple days before, feed for you know one to one and a half weeks after you've introduced her, and that's really gonna up the odds that they accept that queen. Um, don't remove the old queen from the hive without taking possession of your new queen um, in case she dies in the mail or the, the queen breeder it runs out of queens or ships are late. 
you know, you don't want to end up with a hive that's queenless for two or three or four days before you get a new queen. So once you get that queen in and healthy, um, give her a few drops of honey, a few drops of water in that cage, keep her at room temperature out of direct sunlight, and then go out to your hive. Ideally that same day, remove that old queen and then insert that new queen in the cage right away. Um, remember to keep the queen cool. Direct exposure to sunlight in the summer will, uh, for any, you know, for more than a few, you know, 30 seconds, will damage queens. I've definitely killed queens accidentally by letting them be in direct sunlight for a couple of minutes on a really hot day. So keep them cool um, and then remove that queen from the hive. And, you know, you, you can wait an hour or two, you know, within an hour or two, the bees are going to know they're queenless. I usually put the queen cage, the new queen cage in the hive immediately um, after pulling out the old queen because, you know, it's going to take them two or three days to eat through that candy to release her anyway. So may as well go ahead and stick her in there in the same trip. So I'm going to show you guys to summarize a lot of this. Um, I'm going to show you guys a quick video um, about how on a practical level, excuse me, on a practical level, how to um, requeen a hive. And this is going to summarize faster than I can um, how to successfully requeen a hive. So let's so watch this short video, and then I'll have some final conclu concluding remarks on queen rearing. Hey, everybody. Let's talk about requeening a hive. So if you've watched our previous videos, we've identified a hive that needs a new queen. And so we're going to go through and actually show the process once we've already identified a hive that needs to be requeened. We're going to show the process of how to requeen that hive. One thing is you've got to find that queen. So give them some, just a little bit of smoke and you can check out our other video on how to find a queen. But for this video, we're not going to talk about that, but you can always reference back to that video. So we're going to find our queen and we're going to have to remove her from the hive. And the big debate is always, do you leave her in the hive? Do you uh, kill her and leave her in the hive? Or do you remove her from the hive? I always like removing the queen because even if she is no longer alive, she's still giving off pheromones inside that hive. And we want those pheromones to dissipate as quickly as possible. So, here she is on this side. So I'll give her, remove her from the hive. There we go. All right, so I've removed the queen from this hive. Now I've got my new queen. You can wait up to 24 hours to install the new queen, or if you already have her, you can install her right away after killing her. It's ideal to wait, you know, two to 24 hours, just so all those pheromones from the old queen dissipate. But since we're here with this video, we're going to go ahead and install her. So your queen cages come in all different forms. Sometimes they'll have a little cork that plugs up the candy. So you can see we've got candy in here. I just removed that cork so that candy is exposed so the bees can chew and let her out over the next few days. And so I'm going to install this right in the heart of the brood nest, right between these frames, the candy side facing, uh, facing down. It's just going to slip in there right like that. I'm going to push that tightly back together and you can see the bees already smell her. They're already running towards that new queen. It's going to take them two to four days to release that queen. I'm going to come back in about seven days and check and make sure I see eggs in this hive. As soon as I see eggs, I'm going to close it back up and give them another week or so before I do a deep dive inspection. And that's how you requeen a hive. Simple as that. So pretty simple overall, um, really. I mean, it's not uh, it's not terribly complex uh, to get that new queen inserted in there and uh, let them let them do their thing. So one thing I do want to correct myself on from that video, uh, if you're requeening, that was a, a when I was requeening in the spring. But if you notice, I put that cage uh, near you know just right near the top of those frames. I inserted it 
just right below the surface of those frames and it was a single story hive. So if you've got a double story hive, a two, two boxes, it's fine to put it there. If you've got a single story hive, that's gonna get really hot in the summer. You actually wanna scoot that cage down about halfway down between uh, kind of in the middle of that frame instead of having that cage up near the top because up near the top will often uh, overheat the, and kill the queen because she gets too hot. So scoot that cage down about halfway down the frame um, if, if it's the summertime and it's a single. So finally, I'm um, doing check backs, you know, go back in about seven days, look for cleared patches where there could be eggs. If you've, you've probably heard me say before, use your smartphone to take some pictures and then zoom in on your smartphone to see if you can see eggs and uh, you can look for new queen cells signs that your hive did not accept a new queen well if there are queen cells everywhere like you see over here on the left or even hatched queen cells if you waited a little longer than seven days that's a sign that typically that she wasn't accepted and they're raising a new one so if you see queen cells all over the place and you do not see um, eggs all over the place then they didn't accept that queen and at that point you can um you can put in, you can try putting a new queen in, or you can just let the bees continue on and finish raising their own queen. I often let them finish raising their own queen at that point, because by the time I can get another queen ordered and get her in and get her in the hive, that virgin queen is probably about ready to hatch out anyway. So typically speaking at that point, I just let them do their, do their own thing. So, um, there you go. Uh, again, a huge thanks to James, Sherry, and Dodie uh, for speaking with us tonight. And we actually are going to end right on time. Imagine that. Um, you will get a follow-up email, as always, with the webinar recording, links to the products, and links to our free magazine. And um, if you're watching this as a recording later, you can always go to our website, texasbeesupply.com under webinar and sign up to view this live. So with that, um, we will see you all in September with uh, Randy Oliver. And if you have any questions, feel free to continue putting them in the Q&A box and we'll answer those as long as you keep putting them in. So we'll see you in September, folks.